Okay. I'll go live. Second edition. I should probably change that title. I just realized I'm not following. Oh, a new follower. DDX Aiden has followed what? It's I don't almost... know. I don't know how I wasn't following before. <laughs> it's almost like he's on the stream with us. Almost, almost. All right. So the stream has started, and so hello hey. YouTube because this is going to go on YouTube. Uh, today we are streaming the second Champion of the Board Challenger Arena uh, with DDX Aiden. Hello everyone. Woo. Um. And so basically the difference between the last one and this one is this is going to be a 2 plus 5 uh, tournament uh, where, where there will be 11 rounds. It's a Swiss tournament. So basically how Swiss works is uh, the players with similar amounts of points or, or the top players uh, all play the top players, the lower players all play the lower players, and you continue to get points uh, for each of your wins. Um, so we've, we've got a really, really strong arena here. As you can see, the top uh, top 12 people are over 2,000, and we've got 24 people in the tournament, so should be good. Uh, Aiden, do you have any um, uh, thoughts on? Uh, do you have any predictions here? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really excited to see this. Uh, like you said, a lot of strong people, a lot of strong players. Um, I think for Hachid Grom, obviously top rated, probably my top pick here for the, for the yeah, win. Yeah, certainly. A very strong player. So let's let's right off the bat go look at a uh, Hatchet Grom's game. Um, so E3 as as expected. Um, E3, yep. Winning yeah. move, guys. Winning move. <laughs> uh, yeah. Nice haircut, ten. I appreciate that in the chat. Yeah, I did get a haircut. But so <laughs> and we see the modern defense with E6, and we go with the the main Watkins line. Um, I actually don't know it too well. I always played, like I always play some sort of weird off theory line because I don't want to have to study all these queen races. But it obviously Grohaja Grom probably knows it pretty well. Yeah, it looks like Grohaja Grom speeding ahead here. <laughs> Clearly knows the line. Yeah, already gained thirty five seconds. B seven gives him lots of options. Yeah, certainly does. And Clunk doing the same, just just giving giving themselves a nice path or or several nice paths. True, and this is one of those classic queen race positions where Stockfish would would know exactly what to do, but pretty <laughs> tough to calculate as a as a human. For sure. So now, obviously, you don't want to recapture the queen. That might be a poor decision. So taking this pawn is is definitely what you want to do. Lots of stuff up for capture. Okay, he opts not to take it. Mm -hmm. And so now, with this with this capture down here, Grohacha Grom is basically saying, okay, I'm going to play against all your pawns, because you're probably not going to take on H... Well, I guess, I mean, I guess you could take on H1. No matter where you capture, uh, White's going to recapture back, and then there's no good way to, to give away all your pawns. So basically, Grohacha Grom will end up something with, like, two rooks and a queen and a knight or something like that uh, which will all basically just play against the pawns which are which is very winning uh, for white here yeah so he's, so he's managed to get himself to an end game here where his pieces just far out outpace and outplay the pawns very exactly, nice yeah the only concern would be uh, this H pawn over here but I feel like pushing one pawn over over four is is gonna be significantly quicker Yeah, and you can see here that I mean these central C and D pawns are just far too non-maneuverable. Yeah, he's not gonna he's not gonna be able to be in time. Exactly. Yeah. This knight could be a problem though. What's is he just gonna let it capture? Well, with a beautiful rook a three now now when the pawns push, then you recapture with the rook. And these pawns like you can give away your rook eventually, but you don't even have to. You can yeah. As as Garocha Grom does, just pushes the pawn. You can capture these pawns. Your rook and knight are going to be able to maneuver to uh, a, a nice place to uh, to sacrifice. Very nice tactical maneuver. Clunk hanging in there still. Mhm. Mm the problem here is once the pawn gets to c4, then you can give up the rook and the knight, and your pawn will already be so far ahead that you've got a rook promotion already lined up. With 
fat pawn push, I think it's in the books for a clunk here. Mm -hmm. Nice. Very well played by Croagic. Mm -hmm. An interesting queen race to start off the day. Um, if we look back at the tournament, there's... St okay, the final game is still going on between um, between Sarang and Flo. Flo oh, with many more pieces here. Yeah. But the question is, is like, for example, this knight all the way over on B3 might be a little bit too far away. Don't really know yet. Um, it seems a little bit out of position. What promotion do you think is best here? Um, well, when I look at this, I think, um, okay, so, uh, y you know what? You might be able to, like, there are some tricks with something like a bishop promotion. Um, because, first of all, your king's defended. Uh, and then if you move your king, your your knight's defended. So you definitely have to play something like e6 first. Um, or you, you could play something like king to, uh, king to c7. Uh, originally, but then your rooks defended, your knights defended, so it just becomes confusing. So king's probably king's always generally a safe promotion. Um, so yeah, Looks so standard here. Mm -hmm. so I think the idea here is you wanna you wanna keep your rook, you wanna you wanna push your pawn, uh, maybe eventually get your rook onto the G file, so then it sort of protects your pawn with it. Pushing that pawn up the board is probably the best option here to to prevent that king from sacrificing itself, right? Because the mm -hmm. name of the game is cutting that king off. Right. Now I think, yeah, the thing for Flo here, you want, you certainly want to keep the rook out of the way for now. Um, and now, I don't know if you, so yeah, you just move the knight because. It, you, your promotion there isn't as nice yet. Now you can promote to bishop, which can certainly cut off a lot more squares. Um, however, you have to be careful with bishop. For example, if you promote to bishop and play bishop to uh, a d5 eventually, there could be some tactics of something like uh, uh, king f7 where both the knight and the bishop guard that one square that the king can move True. to. Some sneaky tactics there mm -hmm. for the lone king. Mm -hmm. So theoretically, uh, king knight rook versus king is is a win for king knight rook, which is actually shown in a great game uh, in the 2001 anti chess world championships between uh, it was Nudrum or Tim Remmel and I forget who the other player was. Uh, it might have been Fabrice Liardet, but uh, the crazy thing was there was he managed to do it over. Mind you, it was 20 plus 10. Uh, time control, but it, it was a fantastic game. Uh, I highly recommend checking it out. There are studies on Lee Chess. I know, I'm know. pretty sure there's one by Program Fox that's really good and it showcases that game. Looks like, looks like Flo opting not to sacrifice the bishop here, going for more of a positional approach to this mm -hmm. end game. Certainly making this round last a lot longer. And there's the, there's the little trick we talked about. See, now uh, the knight and the bishop both guard squares where they can sacrifice to, uh, they, they double defend. Yeah, a very nice move by Serang. Um, and now there's nothing Flo nice can do. Stuff. Yeah. Nice number ten. Interesting first round. Yeah, for sure. So we still got we got several people with a win. We got we got four people with a draw. Uh, let's take a look here. Let's let's uh, look in at Sequela versus Glau two DK. Two very strong players. I'm pretty sure two titled players at that. Um, Shots for E3. E3, B5, so we see classical. And we well, see. Well, lagging behind a little bit there on a forced capture, but. <laughs> <laughs> and we see an interesting B3 move. Which you, so now, you no, longer, no longer Watkins approved. <laughs> no. <laughs> so now we see this queen, and we see king captures. So an interesting position. It it doesn't look like it varies too far from uh, the general Sjeng defense, uh, but certainly something new that I personally have not seen before. And it's it's probably a little uh, maybe that's part of the uh, 
maybe that's part of the opening choices. Most people don't know how to play against it, and so uh, you can you can find a lot more mistakes in in opponents' play. True, and it looks like just looking at the uh, the record between these two players, it looks like Sequilla has a large advantage on the match. So maybe this is something they've played before, and right, and uh, Sequilla knows this line. Yeah, that's true. Good point. So we see this just pretty strong for black here to me. I mean, lots of they've got um, pretty good space with that pawn on c5. Mm -hmm. The one thing that could provide a problem in the future, though, is these uh, these advanced pawns for for white, for example. Uh, if if eventually this c4 or the c5 this strong c5 pawn for black does get dislodged, uh, c5 and a5 for white could become incredibly strong. Um, just grabbing more space, and then on, on the king side, y you've got lots of lots of nice pieces. If you can somehow get this bishop into the end game, uh, if you get your knight developed, your rook across the back rank, uh, uh, you're probably doing pretty well. True. Quite an interesting play here from from Glawi to DK, moving the knight out of the way of the queen, mm -hmm. but to create some some interesting counterplay here, because now the queen can no longer let the rook out. Mm -hmm. Right, because if, if queen b8, then you can just recapture with the knight. Making Sequilla think a little bit. Definitely mm -hmm. losing some time on the clock. Mm -hmm. We see this this nice move. It both attacks the king and, uh, and it attacks this pawn, which would uh, bring the knight out, uh, turn the knight into a bit of a loose cannon. Uh, but uh, but Glau 2 dk advancing the knight think probably the idea is to capture the pawn and then the bishop, then your knight's not completely dead. Um, but, uh, as we'll see here, uh, the queen captures here, this will now open up the rook. Um, now the king captures the knight yeah. and the rook is out. Right. So this should be a winning endgame for Sequela here. Yes. There's several ways to do it. Knight e2 is a nice one. Oh, it just brings it back. Oh, that's nice. Just moving the knight back and forth. Very, very orthogonal rook movement. Can be controlled <laughs> by that knight. Nice. There nice you go. Up. Nice game there. Uh, we still got several games going on. Uh, let's take a look in at uh, Jalp and um, and real NP real quick. Thing looks like Jalp lower on the clock. Only about a minute left. It seems to be in still a middle game. So. Mm-hmm. Be looking at some time trouble in the future, but he gets plus five seconds. Okay, moves the pawn. Mm -hmm. So really, the problem here for White is is this bishop's really stuck. And to be honest, uh, the black bishop isn't doing too bad. Like, there's no way that you can immediately punish it, um, and and you'll be able to it, sacrifice it whenever you want. Uh, because if you ever give up the g3 pawn, uh, even even something like g4. Uh, a lot of people forget that you can capture on passant. Uh, so capturing, so your pawn gets on g3, and now your bishop's really, uh, really safe. And you got lots of space for it. And your pawn, who knows, you're, maybe you're even promoting uh, soon. Um, so this black bishop isn't in too much danger. Uh, but this white bishop is not only pinned to the pawn, but it can't move anywhere without an immediate loss. Uh, for example, bishop to a3, uh, you'll have uh, you'll have knight c5, and then you'll have that string of captures. Um, and however, now that I think of it, Bishop B two might have been a sneaky move there. Um, because getting rid of the king, right? Before yeah. The game. Mm -hmm. Now Black seems very bunched up on the edge here. This is really tough to maneuver for Black, given just given how uh, immobile the, the like this knight and rook are. Like, for that sure. Quite trapped in the back there. Yes, definitely. And not a lot of time on the clock, like I said. Mm-hmm. So yeah, not not a lot of different moves because after after something like yeah uh, c6 now your bishop's safe actually because this this pawn was moved um, so you might even be able to play d4 and then try to sacrifice your pawn and then advance your other pawn uh, with some threats like that in the future. However, uh, note that you can't just give up the pawn immediately because after c6 and um, and a and a5. 
after the knight captures there, you have no really good continuation. Um, so you definitely have to move your king somewhere. Uh, like maybe... Uh, so after after d4, you might have to move your king to d3 or something like that, just preparing for... yeah. A nice, a nice in-between setup move. Often forgotten, but sometimes necessary. Mm -hmm. And a strong a5 move, at least for now, definitely, because uh, cause now if you try to set up the knight... Uh, to capture all the pieces again, uh, obviously white can't uh, push this a4 pawn immediately. This should be an interesting game though, because both players are starting, definitely jumps much lower on time, but both players definitely starting to get there. Quite low on the clock here. Rook move. He's playing it quite well, I mean, for, for such a trapped little position, he's, yeah. he's quite effectively blocked off these pawns. Looks like it might be falling apart not here, though. <laughs> okay, black resigned, yeah. but but of a, an exciting game at that. True. Um, and we have one more game that's still going on, so let's take a look at uh, Soccer King and Vishal. Sorry in advance to anyone I butcher the name of. <laughs> like Soccer King left with a string of quite disconnected pawns and a rook. Mm -hmm. Mostly immobile. Let's see what he can do with it. Okay. Promotes to a king. And mo very mobile piece. Helps his position, I'd say. Yep. And it's actually a nice find because you'd think with all these white pieces just stranded around this, you'd think a lot of promotions aren't extremely safe. Um, so in this case, you do have to give up the king, though. Ooh. Because now, knight and then rook automatically wins the game because of the stalemate. True. Very clutch find. Yes. Alright, so after after round after round two we still have seven players. Um, after round two looks like still a seven way tie for first here. No yeah. one top seven haven't dropped a game. So I'm gonna take a look in at Grohacha Grom again versus uh Rin Bakurva, who's also a very old player. Uh I when I was first starting my journey to anti chess uh, understanding, I I played countless O plus one games against Rin Bakurva. Always a good time. So uh, very strong this player. Looks, this looks like the line we saw earlier from. So he's playing this mm -hmm. again. Except this time instead of uh, Queen G five, we see C five, which is definitely Wat Watkins approved, uh, and Queen A five. I'm pretty sure. The main Watkins line is is b6, but uh, but queen a5 is still uh, uh, most certainly a viable queen race. I don't know why I keep choosing the queen races; they're the hardest to uh, the There's hardest to commentate. Trade. Yeah, and and and, and yeah. Maybe we need Grohachi Grom on here. He clearly, yeah, he clearly knows his queen races. He's gone yeah. into at least two of them now. Yeah, and comfortable, because most of the time when you're when you're the higher rated player, queen races are, are generally referred to as more of a like a, a toss up sort of thing. So generally if you're like a lower rated player you probably want to make it a uh, messier and more off theory queen races against your opponents because y you have a better chance of maybe maybe forcing out a blunder. Uh but Grohacha Grum seems to be like very comfortable and 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 doesn't yeah, doesn't screw up easily even in in these queen races, or at least that we can see. Yeah, so quite so these pawns are quite connected though on on both sides. Mm -hmm. So I think the idea here for white is you probably want to end up capturing every piece except for the e6 pawn. Maybe end on something like h7. So then this lone pawn is the only thing black has left. Um, the only concern would be maybe. Uh, if black takes the h1 rook uh, and then ends up capturing the final capture on h2 if possible uh, because then the queen will have to come back uh, and capture and capture that pawn before capturing the e5 pawn. Sure. And Grohacid really thinking on this move. Got to be pretty accurate here because in a queen race you can all flip in, in but a second. So. I'm sure he's analyzing all possible captures. He's got four, including the queen. Mm -hmm. Mm 
tough to diagnose what he's thinking about. Mm -hmm. So we'll start off with this. We definitely know capturing on G1 will almost... Uh, actually, capturing on G1 could even be okay, but we see that. The, the reason I was thinking about that is because the knight defends uh, D6, and even if you try to like move the knight, or, or actually I guess moving the knight's going to be sufficient, uh, but... So, yeah, don't anyway, capture on G1. He ups. He yep. ups not for the G1. So, draining down the clock. Right, we are both, thinking. Yeah. both clocks running down very quickly. But now, Drohachigram has kind of forced himself into a into a one-sided string of captures. He doesn't have any options now after capturing the knight. He's right. got to go down the line. And so maybe for Ring Bakurva, this means, uh, because you already know what's going to happen, maybe you can more accurately uh, uh, calculate your final moves. Yeah, and, and even just, just looking at the um, the score between these two players, you can see they're quite old school. Mm -hmm. Looking very old matchup. Lifetime score of over 200 games. Not too shabby. But yeah, so if we look at these captures here, um, uh, so if you take on, say, c2 first, uh, then queen's obviously going to capture on on f7, and that's exactly what we see. Um, so after queen captures f7, then you got a couple different captures. Um, you got you can capture on a2, capture on h2. And if we see the capture on a2, we're still probably going to see uh, this capture down here on on h7. So then when the queen comes back and captures on h2, you don't have to recapture with the queen. You can recapture with the rook. So we'll see queen takes h7 here. And then after the queen takes h2, then you capture with the rook. Because if the queen captures, then you have to recapture the pawn. Um, and that is game now. So good game. Good queen race. Uh, still got, oh. we got one game going on now, but it looks like it's about to be finished. And in the rankings, we can see Rohacha Grum and tied for first with Real NP. And Sequela oh, and now now. Sequela. Yeah. So, three-way tie from first, down from the seven last round. So we're finally seeing some leaders emerge here. Yeah. So, actually, we, we, we've seen Rohacha Grum a couple times, but this might be an interesting game to look at between uh, Sequela and Rohacha Grum just because... Uh, they're both currently tied, undefeated. We see the 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 Watkins line of the wing attack in the in the Liard at defense. Um, and this just looks like a very solid position for Black. You're not overcommitting anything. Get the queen out there. It looks like he might go into another queen race here. <laughs> but so but, here, yeah, quite solid. So here, the theory is definitely H3. Um, which is uh, a line that we saw a ton in the 2019 Anti-Chess World Championship between Ogle and Arimacat, or Arimacot. Uh, we saw H3 probably like half the games, uh, this, this Watkins line. But we Ooh, see A5, A5, so a little bit of a more interesting line. So this this also allows though for the queen to capture and then for black to have a free move. Exactly. If, yeah. If they want. Mm -hmm. That could be quite interesting. What, what would you say black's idea in this position is then? Um, one the things that I immediately look at is I see okay so maybe something like bishop b3 and you double the pawns. Um, I also look at for black this a5 pawn can become a nuisance. So if you don't see, uh, if you don't see a series of of captures immediately that cause you to win. Uh, then definitely getting your knight out to something like uh, d7, then f, and then f8 uh, is definitely a good idea. You don't want to be stuck uh, behind that a6 pawn forever. Uh, and the other thing about this position is uh, maybe if white gets rid of the queen at one point, your doubled knights are a very nice structure. Maybe you can put them on something like h7 uh, and h6, and then maybe even move them to like f6 and f5 sometime in the future. Sure, and it looks like black has kind of done exactly that going into a double knight endgame here. Mm -hmm. So interesting position where white's queen is out, black has a free move. 
Still has that lingering threat of the pawn on a5. Could come forward at any time. So, the the one difference that I see between this push of the pawn on a5 and the h3 where we saw earlier um, was... Uh, in the the position would end up actually extremely similar. It's just you probably have pieces on something like uh, c4 and a4 rather than b3 and a5. So just slightly different positionally. Uh, maybe that c pawn is a little stronger. You might be able to pressure the knight, uh, but and and it makes your bishop a little more stuck in. But it's more more than playable for sure. It looks like Groajagam going into the think tank here. He might be trying to analyze see if there's a a forced mate for for him with this queen out. Maybe looked at something like knight c6 here. Oh, interesting. Some in-between moves, perhaps. I think the idea here was uh, white can't uh, white can't um, force black to capture after three moves, uh, but in exactly three moves, black is going to be able to get uh, a force capture back. And the problem is you can't end your capturing this this pawn on f5. You can't capture that pawn, um, so you can't even end your capturing after one or two pieces because you, Black has one, two, three, four, five different pieces that are all connected for a queen. Nice, good find by Grohachigram there. Yeah, it is. And we just and see a straight yeah. resignation. Yeah, so quite strong. So yeah. Grohach and Grom in the lead alone with four points. Um, now looking and at it, now, let's, real NP could come from behind. Them. Yeah, let's let's take a look at the real NP game. Obviously, real NP is our only other uh, undefeated player left. And I really like this a7 move. It just forces this rook to have to be given up. Because um, now once you take this rook, for those who don't know why you'd want to take that rook, uh, now black's just left with pawns. Pawns are very tough to maneuver. Meanwhile, if you have a bunch of major pieces, maybe you promote a rook or something like that, uh, then y your pieces can move incredibly fast and, and sacrifice much easier than these very slow pawns. Mind you, it's not. It won't be easy, but it certainly gives an advantage. True, and one of my, one of my thoughts is that <coughs> White still has this pawn on a2, so even though they have more mobility, they are they are kind of lagging behind in the, in the uh, hanging pawn race. Mm-hmm. See how this plays out. Another interesting thing is it might be hard uh, to get this bishop to a nice position now after this pawn push, um, because like something like bishop to b2 to e5 is going to be tough to do, uh, because then you can't like it's just very very difficult to get your bishop to somewhere like along the uh, a7 to g1 diagonal, which is generally what you want to do because you don't want your opponent to promote onto a light square. Uh, if that happens then they can just promote bishop and it's going to be a draw. Um, and so and it it's, looks like that might end up happening here. Right, yeah. And not to mention, real NP quite down on the clock here, only 22 seconds to mm -hmm. Vishal's 2 minutes and 30 seconds. And maybe something even nicer would be something like a king promotion. Uh, because Black's Black's e pawn, or at least it it could be a thought, because Black's e pawn is so far pushed. Um, so when you sacrifice, your pawn's going to be on the third rank already, while your opponent's still stuck in the middle of the board. Very true. And and Vishal finding this idea immediately. But real MP with a good job of defending it. See, as soon as the king gets close, uh, you have a series of captures that you can. Uh, like for example, rook f2, bishop b2 to d4, and uh, and you're protecting your pawn pretty sufficiently. Very good for him to find that defense with only 20 seconds on his clock. Mm -hmm. and he opts for to go for a second rook here, maybe maybe to add maneuverability to his to his piece game. Thank you for the follow, the triple ds, or the triple ds. And so this plan now, um, oh, and maybe that was, maybe that was some sort of mouse slip, but now we just have a mate in two, 
Um, Shoot, king moves into f5 and the pawn right there to right. pop it up. Maybe, I, I think a right idea, like trying to keep the rook, but in that case it may have been too late. Um, True, and that, and that does put Grohachid Grom into the top spot. Still a couple of games left in this right. round, though. Vishal's still undefeated, but just not um, completely winning in everything. Um, With two games left, or one game left, I guess, now. Um, Soccer King versus Change Opening, and once again we see uh, Change Opening with several pieces to to his opponents. With very few pieces. And so we do see setting up for this string of captures here. And I'm guessing that Flo's main idea here will be exactly to cut off the king from the E file, keep it away from that last promoting pawn, and somehow. And then the, I think the idea here is rook g8, uh, because your pawn is so much further ahead, um, you can push this and you can. Uh, and here's a, actually a fun position here. Um, most likely going to see king to f7 because you want to block off rook promotion. But then bishop promotion is actually completely winning um, because after something like king f6, uh, you don't have to recapture the pawn immediately. Uh, and now you can just attack the king with something like uh, bishop g7 or you play something like uh, bishop e5 and then... Uh, after the pawn is pushed, then you attack the king with bishop f6 like that. Um, Very nice maneuver in here. Mm -hmm. Very really good job seeing that promotion from Flo. Of course, you expect that from a 2200 player. <laughs> right. And now just getting the bishop close enough in where he can sacrifice it. There it is. Very nice. All right, heading on to the fifth round now. As we said, Grohachagram in the lead. Vishal not far behind with the draw. We'll see if they get paired up. They do. Uh, right. So we could we could jump in for that game. Um. So Garcia Gram again opting for the Liard defense, or Liarde, depending on where you're from or how you want to pronounce it. And a nice C5 move. I I I generally like these moves as well. It sort of uh allows you to take on B4, um, uh, with the pawn instead of the knight. Taking here. Active. Recapturing with the queen. Obviously, if you recapture with the pawn, then it be can become very annoying with your rook pinned to your knight. And what's the evaluation here? What's, what what is each side looking to looking to do, and and how are they already? So I think the the general idea or the advantages for both players in this position is Garacha Grom's going to get a king out of it, um, and and White's going to be left with pretty few pieces. Um, however, the one thing that white can look a little bit at is, as as of right now, black is fairly undeveloped. Like, you got your knight developed, but both your bishops are stuck behind pawns as of now. Uh, your knight can't come to something like h3 or, e, or e7 as of now. Uh, neither of your rooks can really move that well. Um, however, as you'll see, maybe with something like d5, bishop to h3, um, this certainly looks pretty nice for black right now. Um, moving the king out so then your pawns don't, or I guess you're going to move your pawn anyways. But uh, but definitely things are possible in this position for Hachigram right now. Something like knight f6. Uh, if the knight ever moves off the back rank for Vichel, then something like rook e8 could be deadly. Um, so now, I, if, I, if I were to choose a side, I'd probably choose black. You've got more pieces. Uh, you're able, you've got lots of room to develop now. Uh, whereas before it might have been a little trickier. So yeah. Yeah, quite good analysis, and I would say, yeah, just based on the fact that both um, both Vichel's rooks are on the back rank, quite immobile, given uh, Rohajic Ram's mobility on his own back rank. Every square is covered, so those rooks can't move, and it just, it, basically, it's total suffocation for black in this position. Mm -hmm. And maybe um, maybe a missed, a missed uh, move here from Grohachi Grom on move 18. Maybe instead of king c6, you have rook e8. Uh, then both of the rooks will be defending the e1 square. You're going to have to capture with one of them. 
Um, but in this case, uh, Vishal plays uh, this move anyways, and now after you capture uh, the king here, uh, uh, and y y you certainly have to move the knight or the rook, um, so opting to move the rook, and... This will be a pretty clean endgame for Grohachigam, rated 2200, I'm sure. Uh, right, and, and maybe, so uh, if the king is captured, then you're going to play c4, most likely, because um, then rook oh, captures, shoot. bishop captures, and then you open up the rook, and that just makes it that much easier. True, true. Don't want the bishop... There's never, it's never too late to blunder maiden one. <laughs> out for many. Yeah. So. But instead, Grow Hotcha Grow makes it very fun for us by finding that very fun intermediate move. So you'll just have to move this rook out of the way and, and find the um, find the path to get this remaining a7 pawn. And there we see it. Nice so. done. So, good game. Gracha Grom remains undefeated. Uh, let's take a look in at Real NP and Ray Costa. We haven't seen Ray Costa yet. Uh, Ray Mundo. But certainly a... a um, sorry, go ahead. Oh, it looks like we're still in the middle game here, so I think we came in at a good time. Mm -hmm. Moving towards the end game. Uh, Ray Costa have been around for uh, several, several years. I remember when I was... When I was first starting my my journey of anti chess about two years ago, uh, I always remember watching the games of Ray Costa, who's already uh, a very strong player and a very nice uh, discovered attack here with the bishop. Yeah, true. And I was gonna say maybe we can even see that strength just based on the the timers on the board. Ray right. Costa up almost five times the time of real NP here. Not not too worried about. Um, about the clock situation. Mm -hmm. Probably knows, probably knew the opening extremely well, and then didn't have to think too much about the middle game because could use that time thinking on real NP's time. So now threatening giving the king uh, and opening up the rook here, but see, this c pawn moving is going to be a a nice outlet. Or at least for now, because if you sacrifice the king, then you've got a... Or if you sacrifice the king on b5, then you can capture with the c pawn. But as it happens, he, he locks up both of his pawns. So, right Costa only, only able to move the rook here. Right. And could be an interesting endgame, actually. If real NP wasn't losing on the clock, maybe, but... He's quite close to timing out. See if Hopefully he can pull it out on the board. Yeah, I think after this pawn push, you, you get rid of your pawn and your bishop. Um, and then rook promotion, you might you might be you might, you might yeah, be doing might well. Be just He's gonna have to find it with only ten seconds though. Yeah, definitely. Quite a def tall order. The good rook thing about promotion. this format is he gets five seconds every turn. Mm-hmm. And see, so rook to rook to f1 may have been a bit of a small blunder. Uh, rook a2 was probably a little bit stronger, but who knows? Um, because of the pawns locked in the center, a rook versus king endgame isn't uh, incredibly easy. You can't ever move your rook onto the fifth rank. Players might even just agree to a draw here. Looks like they're just going to shimmy their kings over to the side where the pawns are. <laughs> Definitely looks like a draw to me. Is this... Would you consider this a draw? Um, it depends if if white can safely get the rook onto the third rank. Um, or, in this case, giving up the king um, will most likely result in a draw uh, because white can never move the rook onto the fifth rank, so you can never like force the king back, for example. And white offers a draw now, but draw isn't accepted yet. I think Ricosta really wants to use this time. Maybe if he can, he can find a way to somehow, uh, somehow force a blunder out of real NP because certainly it's not impossible with the with the time separation. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's always good to play on sometimes, given the time situation, but he does end up going for the draw. Mm -hmm. All right, headed into this sixth round now. Rajagram on top with five. Sequela not far behind with four, and then a couple with three and a half. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, let's take a look in at uh, how about Galau 2 dk and Vishal. We're already zooming through to the double pawn defense uh, and the the Zheng variation. Play. This is a line I must I I like to play this where pawn to c6 guards the bishop and then you move it back and pretty solid for black. I, I enjoy playing this position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Opening up a little discovered attack on. D2 pawn maybe gives a tempo for, for something like queen h5, but you're still you're still certainly doing fine. Yigami was like knight e2 maybe. You got, however, you definitely have to be careful here uh, because of the move bishop b2 right here. Right. Because now... Oh no, devastating. Devastating. <laughs> yeah. How? <laughs> that would... Yeah, because now you force the knight to capture. So the idea is if rook captures on g1 and rook recaptures... Um, now you have to, uh, at least he had the knight on, uh, d7 to recapture this knight, I guess. Uh, True. So it's not totally lost here, but you can definitely see that. Mm-hmm. Because in the past, like, if, if you didn't have your knight there, then you were going to have to capture the f6 pawn with your knight, and then it's completely all over. Uh, because then this rook's just safe on the g-file and your knight's stuck on f6 where you got threats of like e4. It's quite amusing. This this uh, light squared bishop for Vishal has taken a path from <laughs> c8 back to c8, uh, c8 to d7, back to c8, back to d7, and now it's on e8. And now it legitimately has zero moves, which is pretty quite funny. Quite a maneuver. <laughs> Ooh, nice knight move. I like that. Take away the rook from from Glowy Two DK. And both players with plenty of time, which is something that we have not seen very often. Oh yeah, we've we've tuned into a lot of matches where one side is or down to twenty, thirty, or even single digit in seconds. But this seems quite even. And and who do you which side would you pick here if you had to play one out? Um, that's an interesting question. See, probably with all this time, I'm probably gonna take black, just because I can feel like I feel like uh, with with decent end game, uh, with decent end game, you can at least force a draw. Like at worst, you're gonna force white to promote on a different color square than your own bishop. Um, so not only is it safest, but I also think that you've got lots of opportunities. For example. Uh, your pieces do control a lot more space than white, and they're all very close together, so if you ever need to sacrifice them all at once, they're already in nice positions to do so. Uh, mind you, it's not impossible for, uh, for, for white, as, as the pawns are very far advanced. So, for example, if this c5 pawn uh, moves off of c5, then this black c6 pawn is not going to be fast at all. You're going to have to try to sacrifice it where it is. Uh, so there's certainly a chance for both sides. What about you? What are you thinking? Yeah, I mean, I have a similar thought process. It's always difficult to play only a couple pawns, even with the king. But you know, you're really, you're really immobile. It's really tough to play. You often, you often find yourself not having to move. So, just having the mobility of black, like this knight, can kind of shuffle back and forth while um, Glowy Two DK shuffles with his king or moves his pawn forward is going to be a huge um, benefit, I think, to the black pieces. I would definitely take them in this scenario. Mm -hmm. Looks like he opts to move the king backwards. Mm -hmm. I think the threat now, here is... Top of luck. Yeah, the threat here, definitely king b2, uh, which would be mate in 2. But Vishal going for maybe even king c8, maybe he's looked at the promotions. However, um, yeah, because knight promotion will be... Knight promotion's cut off by the a7 pawn. Uh, bishop promotion... Uh, will be cut off by bishop d7. Um, but the, well, right? by bishop the d7. yeah, but the one problem you gotta look at with bishop d7 is can you give your knight away? Uh, because something like knight d8 or something like knight e5, where you want to keep it kind of close to the action, actually, uh, uh, actually, uh, will have to recapture on c6 there. 
So I mean, maybe I'm missing something, but I actually don't see. And um, and otherwise, you're um, you're gonna have to give away the knight on, for example, d6. But your pawns just aren't pushed far enough where or white will be able to uh, make your pawns come out. But we see a, a knight promotion in any case. Probably something like uh, the fastest mate is bishop to g4. Um, after the take on c6, you play knight e5 and then bishop f3 just for some extra pizzazz. Um, but several ways to win for sure. Sticky yeah, for bishop e6 here. Right, and then upon movement here, we'll end it. Right. Nicely so, done. good game. Um, and we now have. Still ongoing. Yep. Real NP. And this is a rematch, right? We saw this. I think so. Yeah. earlier in the tournament. Quite a quite a difficult position. What's your What's your immediate thought here with this bishop back and double knight versus mm -hmm. knight? My My initial thought is this is like I personally would find this position a little bit tough to play. Um, however. This is like Grohachigram's bread and butter. Positions like this where they seemed really cramped to a lot of people, uh, he manages often to find a way to bring it to slightly above, like slightly better for white. Uh, and as you can see now, like even, like you, you look at it and you're like, okay, this bishop is pinned, it's pretty tough. Uh, but after the, the moves that we just saw, like d4, c5, d takes c5, uh, white actually has like a very, very strong queen side. Um, the bishop, the more you think about it, is actually fairly safe. Uh, you can maybe play something like bishop a3 if it gets annoying. You got bishop b2 if it gets annoying. Um, so really here, it, it does look very, very strong for white, especially uh, in these positions, like these bread and butter, grow hot, it, grow on positions. Nice. Pretty, I mean, low on the clock for real MP here. Under 15 now. I mean, it's tough to find a move to play here for black. Yeah, very Rook moves are kind of scary. You don't want to sack that king too early. Quite tough. And he opts to cocoon in the corner. <laughs> and now we probably might see... <laughs> yeah, probably what I would do as well. But now, yeah, we'll see b5 and then uh, opening up this bishop. Oh, interesting. And now Quite probably... a nice from there. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, and that's going to be the ball game, it looks like. And there it is. Nicely played. Grohacha Grom still undefeated. Yeah. So it looks like your prediction from the start is uh, is going over pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> True. He's He's got a quite a superior tie break as well if, if we're looking at that, mm -hmm. if it ever comes down to that. Let's uh, let's take a look at Sequela versus or Sequela versus Ray Costa. We see a Liarda defense, which is which is funny because I'll play it a little bit, and Grohacha Grom plays it pretty much every time. But you don't see a lot of people playing it, even though it's recommended by like Watkins as the strongest move. Um, so it's interesting that we see Sequela play it. Definitely a two plus five, I would say, one of the toughest, the toughest openings to play against and with. Um, that seems to be a common theme. Is it's very tough to play the Liardet defense, but at the same time, it's almost impossible to play against a good Liardet defense. Sure. I mean, right, as you say, Watkins suggests is, is, uh, is the uh, best move, right? So, mm -hmm. tough to, I mean, many, many lines to consider. Really tough to, to crack, even as white, even though it's, you know, technically winning. But really tough not to crack. And you can see here, that, I mean, look at, look at all these pawns. So far advanced, but nothing to really do. White can't really punish that at all. And mm -hmm. White has a solid position as well. These two pawns up, and Knight um, developed to E2. Right. Just really solid position for both sides. Mm-hmm. Um, and further to that, just going ahead about what we were saying about the the Watkins suggestion line, um, right off the start, move two, bishop a6 is uh, is an is an unproven position. Like they when they were originally trying to solve the Liard at defense, they were trying to solve bishop a6. They went on for about a year and they couldn't make any like a really strong advancement. So as far as we know, bishop a6 is like a completely unproven position. So already as of move two, we have a position where it's like who's better? I, like we don't we don't know. So, quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Still, I mean, quite looks pretty undeveloped here for from both sides. Black still has king and queen, whereas white white queenless here. But mm -hmm. 
still some minor and major pieces. See, Are there I'll, any weaknesses here for either side? Uh, definitely. So the the dark square bishops on both sides are definitely pretty cramped in. Uh, maybe currently this b2 pawn for white is over defended. Maybe like if if black can manage something like queen b6 sometime in the future, that's going to be really annoying. You're going to have to really rather recapture with the bishop. Um, or I guess right as I'm speaking, <laughs> uh, having this rook on b2. I guess is sort of what I was speaking about um, was not only is defending that b2 pawn but as soon as that yeah as soon as that b2 pawn moves your rook is completely opened up quite a quite a quick mop up for Sequela mm -hmm. the clearly the Lehar dead defense yeah reign <laughs> superior uh, it was a very nice outcome for for Sequela there back Sequela in second place only only dropped two games here one against um, Rin Bikurva and one against Grohacha Grom. Speaking of Grohacha Grom, uh, we're most likely about to see another. Oh, but maybe a blunder here. Um, still probably looking in, in Grohacha Grom's favor. But uh, Bishop e7, maybe a bit of a. Uh, who knows? Maybe a, but may, maybe that's the right move. I'm I'm looking at it. Um, just very very interesting position for sure. And what are you diagnosing? You think after rook takes and bishop takes that white has some some kind of counterplay? I'm thinking it? that black has pawns very far back. Um, you might be able to to do some stuff like move your rook onto an open file. Black gets rid of the bishop. Um, and but then takes your knight. Then maybe you have something like, maybe even something like d4. Black takes your pawn. Um, and who knows? Maybe even White's completely winning here. After you take with the king in in d4. It's gonna be quite or, tough to find that. though, because mm -hmm. that queen is is quite a nuisance, protecting a lot of pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, soft heart will have to work pretty hard to find a to find uh, the right moves because it's quite precise, I'd imagine. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is the setup move here, right? Because you're going to take with the king no matter what, but you've got to kind of set up your attack against these three remaining pawns. Right, what, and what would you suggest? and a definitely one thing that you that you can one strategy that you can offer is waiting for black to come to you. Um, eventually. You could even wait till black pushes that a pawn all the way to a3, maybe give your rook on a3, uh, the queen on a1, and then that a2 pawn is right there. So that's like, that's, um, that stops any king promotion because you also have knight back to b1. Um, and bishop promotion looks like it loses, like every other promotion looks very, very difficult to play against. Uh, so I think the strategy here for white is just waiting for the pawn to come to you. There's no rush to go to go after the pawns in any way. Um, sure, but it looks like moving that queen to b1 looking to maybe put one of the pawns on the b file rather than the a and c file. <laughs> Gotta keep in mind here too, soft heart, only 11 seconds on the clock. Now <laughs> 15 of course, but not playing with too much time against mm -hmm. a 2200 master. <laughs> right. Uh, and one thing to note here is um, is Grohacha Grom makes a very nice a6 move. And th what this sort of does is it causes white a little bit more confusion because white can't play like nearly as quickly. Uh, white has to be a little more patient, which is oftentimes hard to find. Um, Here, a very interesting move uh, might even be uh, maybe maybe I've miscalculated this a little bit, but maybe something to look at with Grohacha Grom's two full two minutes is something like a, a like a rook promotion. Um, however, now that I'm looking at it more, uh, actually, now that I'm looking at it more and more, something like e3 rook takes and then moving the king into that file. So we do see a rook promotion though. Yeah, we see the rook promo. I was thinking e3 and then the rook takes, uh, and then moving your king onto that file. The problem is when the white pawn eventually gets to the end, you might have 
a uh, you might have a rook promotion because these pawns are right beside each other, so you can't push one after another. Oh, true. Yeah, it could be quite the weakness for Brohajic Ram. It's quite interesting. Soft hurt with only a small amount of time managing to pull this back from the brink. I mean, he was very close to to losing a bit ago, but this is he's pulled it kind of all the way back. Mm -hmm. And so could could we see the first uh, the first loss to our uh, the first Not that we're loss rooting to against our... Brohajic Ram? No, Tom. no, but it it would be very interesting to see. Anyway, this would be the upset. Soft hurt with a chance to do it. Yeah, I just don't see a way to stop rook promotion though, because anything like rook a4 take, uh, and then after d4 you you just got one lone c pawn. Yeah, there. Look, rook promotion. I think seals the deal. Oh, could still be tough to play king against rook and pawns. We'll see what soft hurt opt for here with. Yep, and we see it. Nice. So I think the important thing here, though, for Grohacha Grom is not giving away the rook until you have to. True. So There's no... Right, it's not necessary quite yet. Probably... Okay, so... We see giving away the pawn by soft heart. Um, and now just moving the king in closer to the kill. And, and Grohacha Grom, the first loss. Yeah. Mind you, still... Still on top of the leaderboard. But. Yep, still winning. Soft heart moves into uh, to five points. Uh, we're seeing an interesting end game over here between Rinbakurva and Vishal. King versus double rook and pawn. Quite interesting. Probably a winning promotion here could be bishop. Bishop promotion's probably winning. King promotion's very tough, but king promotion's probably still winning. It looks like Vishal opting for kind of a suffocation strategy, moving the rook on to the 6th rank to try to cut off that king. And now you have to be careful here. Rook f6 loses immediately because your rooks are uh, double uh, double protecting the f-files. So something like uh, after rook f6, maybe king e4, and you're completely winning. But uh, Vishal sees that, goes to the b-file instead. Not promoting that pawn quite yet, keeping that as a... Keeping his options, I like that. And actually, this what this rook b6 move does so well is it forces the king to have to go away from the d file and the c file because um because so then you can promote to rook. Any move results in like even something like king d5 trying to stay on the file. You've got rook e6 and rook f7. Now that king's so far away. Um, oh, and it looks like he does exactly that. Because so. mm -hmm. every like other move you're like yeah. Nice. Every other move, you're moving closer to a rook or a pawn. So, nice play and just a rook promotion here, or a qu queen promotion is actually faster. But, <laughs> yeah, but no need to get fancy on him with a minute on the clock. So <laughs> just, uh, pretty solid rook walk down here. See a nice rook end game, yeah. Looks like Rinbakurva not making him work for it, not resigning. Yeah. <laughs> so now the out to the maiden 12 or whatever that it is. <laughs> yeah. So because of the king in the corner, either of these moves will win. Yeah, rook c5 and rook d6. Now you just move the rook back to like f6. Or Yep. And... Okay, this makes it take a little longer, but now you have rook a6 and that walk down, yep. Nicely done by Vishal here. Yep. He's probably going to move up in the, the rankings because of that. Mm -hmm. This game was 4 versus 5, so... Yeah, both Rinbakurva and Vishal had 4.5 for this one, so Vishal's going to move up into second place, actually, with 5.5, only having dropped the one game against uh, Grohaji Grom. And having, of course, tied in the first uh, round of the tournament. Just waiting on a, a resignation like, or a king yeah, g8. Yeah, Rinbakurva, Rinbakurva may be typing in the chat, <laughs> waiting. Who knows? Maybe the intensity. Ah, oh, do I go king e8? Do I go king e7? 
Yeah, Dude, yeah, of all his five, of all his five <laughs> moves, he's trying to trying to analyze which loses the the slowest. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to think there's no malintent, no uh, yeah, no saltiness, but you know, It'd be tough. These are high intensity games for the champion of the board. There it is. So we go back to the tournament. All right. Coming into the eighth round now, already seven rounds deep. Mm -hmm. So eighth round would means possibility for more points and many players still within striking distance. Yeah, this, definitely there is a possibility here. If Rohajic Ram drops this game, Vishal, Softheart, or Sequela could all move into the lead. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at Rohajic Ram versus Jelp. Um, we see this A4 move, which is like the Rohajic Ram special. Um, Ting with the king here, and again. As we see in many Grow Hacha Grom games, it's about keeping so many of your pieces and just slowly suffocating your opponent. Um, and as we've seen, yeah, he's quite quite good at that, especially against um, players that are not quite as high rated as him, as they surely haven't had enough experience mm -hmm. at those kind of positions at his level. Might still have to watch out for this queen. Its diagonal is open, but mm -hmm. besides that, not many weaknesses in this position here. Mm -hmm. And maybe even looking at something like b4. Um, it does it does attack your king, but if you can't find a win out of it, maybe you play uh, queen g5 to the uh, g7. Now you're in a power position where you got four different captures you can make. Uh, meanwhile, this bishop will be uh, down. Uh, down completely in your end. We take a look at the the score between these two. Only two games, but Kurohachik Ram having won both of them. I don't know. I doubt that was in this tournament. Yeah. Um, but. However, Jal putting Kurohachik Ram in the in the think box pretty early. It's in the think tank. Definitely. I, I mean, I assume analyzing this B4, or Queen G5, or Queen H5 line. Trying to look for maybe a forced win out of it, otherwise probably doesn't want to give away his king. Mm -hmm. And a problem that could come out of it is even with something like, um, uh, or actually, uh, an another idea could be c4, um, which you think, okay, maybe you're like pressuring the knight and the bishop on c5, but really the secret threat about c4 is actually uh, queen a4 being a possibility. However, however, if Jelp does see that uh, something like Rook A4, Queen takes, uh, could be, could be pretty threatening. Roger Graham, thirty seconds only now. Yeah. He's used about two minutes on this move alone. So, so the deep in analysis. Oh. The immediate Queen G4. Rather than rather than making the Bishop strike first, he's opting for, for Queen movement. I mean, it definitely makes threats, right? He's got mm -hmm. e6 and g7 both on the chopping block. And now a problem certainly is if you just wait for this capture to happen, now b4 is going to be completely winning uh, because of something like king to e1, and then you move the knight to e2, and then you've got so many captures for the bishop to do because your, your queen's not ca protecting your king, um, and you you can play something like king e1. Jop now in the think tank on his own though probably looking to stop exactly that I'm sure he sees it I love it how uh, in, in some of our previous games we're looking and we're like 20 moves in and both players have like 3 minutes and then we're in this game we're on move 8 and both players are down to under a minute but oh, it's just yeah, I didn't even notice that quite interesting only on move 8 here and it's it's in the double digits mm -hmm. just how it shows how quickly you can vary your your movements. Bishop d6. What do you think about that move? Target um, I think the problem with it is that you just allow too many options for Gro Hacha Um, mind you, there's probably not too many better moves. But after Bishop takes a2, takes something like the rook, and now the bishop, when it captures all these pieces, it's gonna have to end up all the way on b2. Um. And nothing will have to capture back. So the idea for Guru Hachigram here, maybe take the knight, take the king, and you want to end up taking that c7 pawn. 
Your rook's not. Like, your rook's. Your rook's on the oh, open. I mean, inaccuracy, though, because I see that if, if king takes here. Grohachikra must have some in between her that he sees, because otherwise the king or the bishop is going to have to take the right. e3 toilet. Yeah. So, Jalp, now putting a little bit of time in, going to have to think about this quite precisely. And it looks like in the in the main tournament, by the way, outside of this game, none of the top ten games have finished. So all top ten players oh, wow. still with ongoing games. Quite so, it's, interesting. so it's getting intense is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, quite intense. Quite, quite uh, much longer games in these later rounds. People are more focused on on getting being precise and being accurate. And so now maybe something after, like, for example, if this knight captures... Okay, so we see bishop captures... Um, and now the knight coming into block right here. Very nice move. Probably see something like b4, and then just sets up for the double capture. Quite nice. Gets rid of his pawns first. Pretty smart. Yeah, and that's looking like a wrap. Good job by Grohacha Grom. Maintains the lead. Mm hmm So let's take a look in at our 2 versus 3 game. Both under 2,000, by the way. What a strong showing from a lot of these players. Yeah. Just shows that anyone, like, a lot. I see, sometimes I see players, like, type in the tournament chat, I don't know, I'm a little lower rated than all these players, I don't know if I should enter. Oh, well, we look at it today, we had probably 15 plus 2,000 players, and our 2 and 3 are 1,800 and 1,900. So it just shows exactly. tournaments like these, it, like, it's it's anyone's game. Yeah, oh, interesting. Vishal opting to keep his queen. Quite a dangerous piece, but... Obviously, the most maneuverable. Mm -hmm. the The important thing to note here is you want to make sure that you keep one piece with your knight. Um, the problem is the knight was all the way back on g one here, so it can be pretty tricky. The thing that I would definitely look for in this position, I sadly, <laughs> it's kind of poor. I haven't studied very many rook and knight versus king endgames. But one thing you could definitely look here is with uh, Softheart just moving the king on the back rank. Um, uh, maybe there's some exceptions, like when the king's on a5, something like knight to b7 forces the king away from that square. Um, Interesting. Looks like Vishal, maybe some of these rook moves look more like um, he's just trying to gain back the time, trying to build up his time bank mm -hmm. a little bit. And then maybe some sort of a breakthrough. It's getting, it's getting kind of dicey as the king moves towards the center. That knight is more uh, more prone to both capturing the king and being captured itself. Right. So Sotrek's got to watch out for that. Don't want to get don't want to get too immobile on the side of the board, but mm -hmm. you also don't want to put yourself in danger in the center. So most imp the the main idea for software here is definitely you want to bring your knight as close to the center of the board as possible, control as much space, maybe force the king onto one of the back ranks. So something like, well, like software kind of opting to to put his his king back there or their king back there anyway. Mm -hmm. Maybe some slight inaccuracies here in this end game. So you definitely want to move your rook further away, otherwise it's going to be a draw. And if we see king back to a, I forget. Okay, they they go for a draw anyways. Um, and is that that was a winning in game for Vishal though? Would you say? Uh, let's let's take a look at it real quick. Um, it does give a positive analysis, but I don't know if that's just because uh, I don't yeah, know if that's like just Dr. because. I think that's a draw. Yeah. But it it might have been. It, it might have been one at certain points. We don't know. I'm True. looking at it, and it just says slightly winning for white. Though. So yeah. there was one point. So if we take a look here, I don't know when the next round is starting, but uh, if we take yeah, if we take a look on move um on move 19, we had an insane winning move, which is actually genius. But uh, on move 19, we have rook e2, which is a position where both the rook Great. and the queen. Uh, are being attacked by the king, but what this rook e2 move does is it prevents the king from being sacrificed by the... Sorry, 
prevents the king to s from sacrificing to the queen or the rook. If the king ever moves over to the d file, then you've got both these pieces lined up and the knight. And other than that, you can just bring uh, your knight to the center of the board. So really, this rookie two move, obviously, very like very very difficult to find, but uh, a very interesting move for sure. Interesting. Quite strong. Maybe there are a couple um, games here that could turn into a study at some point. Yes, definitely. You can make this whole tournament into a to a massive study of interesting games. True. I know Lychess likes to do that for their titled arenas. They make little puzzles from some of the titled games. Have to look into that. Mm -hmm. One more game going on here with Real NP and Sequela. And so when I look at this, I think King F4 probably. And then King G3. And then King G3, and that's there's no no nothing you can promote to that that doesn't that's right. Too bad, quite a close one. Yeah. But Came down to the final Quayla. pieces. Yeah. So the standings right now: Rohatchikram with seven alone at the start or at the in first, and then Sequela Vishal tied with six. Sequela with a better tie break, and then Sockhart five point five. Uh, and so let's let's take a look at Grohacha Grom again with Ray Costa. We see another Liard at defense. Ray Costa opting for this, often plays this Queen F3 line, sorry. And we saw this against Sequela, where Sequela was uh, able to uh, to get out a win here. After the uh, Rook yeah. was on B2, as we That's remember. That's true, yeah. However, in this game, Grohacha Grom opting play e6. Six instead. Creating that weakness there. Then now that knight, knight coming to b4. Got to be careful about this rook coming out. Not 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 a threat yet, but. Uh -huh. But maybe maybe Grohacha Grom has studied this intensely and knows that there is a certain intermediate here. Something like queen g5 maybe is completely winning. He didn't snap play anything, so maybe <laughs> he's not. Maybe he's not quite that studied, but I assume he's got some tricks up his sleeve here. For sure. Got to be careful. These bishop, bishop, and his rook both are pointing towards a three for Grohacha Grom. So if this pawn on a seven were to fall, for example, there's potential um, sacrifice possibilities for Ray Costa, maybe. Mm-hmm. Definitely a lot of pieces eyeing down that a3 square. Yeah, and Grohacha Grom may be concerned about that because he's using a lot of time here to, to consider his next move. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is a position where Grohacha Grom would want to sack his, his dark squared bishop? Um, it's an interesting thought. Um, I, I probably would just because the threat of uh, rook taking on a7... I guess you're not doing that now, but the threat of rook taking a7 and then your other rook coming into capture... Uh, you probably don't want to have to capture both of White's pieces down there. Um, I probably would have given away that bishop. And then the debate is whether you give away the a6 bishop or not, or if you wait for that, because... Um, uh, because, actually, if we go back just a little bit, uh, say you give up the bishop, and then rook takes, and then you do something like rook takes on a7. Uh, the tricky thing for White, actually, is... Knight to a3 is actually the only surviving move because after rook takes, bishop takes, there's actually no way for uh, black to force mate. Uh, the king and knight and queen all protect on e7. Uh, the queen protects the pawn from advancing for d6, and both the king and queen uh, go back to uh, f8. So really, it could be a very tricky position uh, for white there, but Grohacha Grom instead opting to play this in b8 move. And now, obviously down in the time sink, only 20 seconds left. Plays queen, good old queen g5, looks to <laughs> queen versus rook race it. You could be completely lost, down. but then queen g5 and who knows. Yeah, now it's really true, yeah, up in the air. He's got a couple captures he's thinking about. Oh, goes for the pawn. Now, usually, 
in a queen versus rook race, the queen is much better just because of its advanced mobility. But what does this look like to you? I mean, this is this white does white does still have a lot of tricks though, mind you, because uh, rook captures on c8, for example. Uh, if the rook b8 recaptures, oh, but we see this reverse capture. And what I think what this really does is it forces Girl Hachigram to think about it. Probably didn't even expect it, maybe didn't even see it, didn't even think about it. Oh, interesting. Instead, even though his rook is going to be opened here on the H file, it's not a problem because no no piece covers the H file for mm -hmm. Ray Costa. So two very experienced players here, but we do see a massive time advantage for Ray Costa, which. <laughs> Which that combined with the with the king could pre, could prevail in the, sometime in the future. Yeah, definitely. So three minor pieces for Ray Costa versus Roger Grums, two rooks and a bishop. Kind of probably tough to navigate with the rooks though, just given the the trickiness of the knights. Mm -hmm. Got to keep in mind though, Ray Costa's bishop is pretty locked down and definitely. Do you think I mean? Do you think that bishop is more of a hindrance or or um, an asset here? So, in this specific position, so now we look at this uh, pawn recaptures. So previously, it may have looked really, really tough, uh, but now it it can be a very big asset. Uh, after this rook is given away, um, maybe this pawn. You're thinking about this pawn push, um, but it's I don't know. It's just a very very tricky position. On for both sides. Stop the, with, um, that, that pawn push is tricky though. Can't really stop with the knight because the bishop will sacrifice itself. Yeah. So maybe Girl Hacha Grom just pulled, pulled it out there. Yeah, because now. But the really tricky part is if you push. See, now your rook opens up and has to take that bishop. However. Yeah, so the idea there is if C. Sorry, if f4, then knight captures, and but then you can't move your bishop, because then your rook will have to come down and capture. Very sneaky move by Ray Costa. But, uh, yeah, now we see Hirohacha Grom getting kind of forced into capturing that, that bishop eventually here. Mm-hmm. Ray Costa not seen, not seen a mate immediately, though, not... Mm -hmm. Oh, but a very nice move there. Oh, oh, very nice. Takes the pawn, and then the rook is going to have to recapture. Mm -hmm. And then it doesn't allow the bishop to capture the knight beforehand. Very nice. And Grohacha Grom. Defeated by... Let's go down to Ray Costa, and that's going to... Open something up. Now, if we see a win for Sequela here, who does have a very nice position, we could see a tie going into round 10, is it? Yeah, round going into round ten. So this is this has suddenly become a from a one man race to a very close horse race at the end here. Sequela with a very nice position here. However, definitely Okay, one pawn at the end. Defendable. 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 Gonna be quite tough for Vishal though, only twenty twenty odd seconds on the clock, now thirty. Gonna have to move that knight out of the way. Mm -hmm. Or else it's an instant loss. But he does. I mean, Rook looks quite solid to me here. I don't think anything. Yeah, will I'm just get yeah. Turned on. Yeah, I'm calculating that as like immediately. But I just think the knight on h 8s just too far. Yeah. Yeah, and it looks like we do see that from Sequela. And the a pawn's just not advanced. Oh, you're not. Actually, no. Oh, if if he had one more tempo. This yeah. Could just say G6. F4 and then H3 and you have to take the pawn, but it, it's not quite there. He doesn't mm -hmm. have enough time. I was even thinking, uh, yeah, so it's very close. Or even in this case, if the knight's on G6 right here, then you have A4 in the True. future. But you but gotta be careful here. Ended. You yeah, have to be careful here because you think you think Rook G2, you take the knight and you're completely won. But the crazy thing, yeah, see, so H7 and then knight promotion. Completely oh, wow. winning. A brilliant tactic. Yeah, does oh, he see it? Oh, are we gonna see it? Oh my gosh. Sequela, maybe knowing he's There it is. And we do. That's oh extremely nice. Yeah, what a brilliant what a tactic. Yeah. 
And that, that tactic actually saves Grohachik Ram. Oh, but mm-hmm. Vishal. Yeah. Vishal moves into yeah. Tide. It actually puts Vishal, that tactic puts Vishal oh, wow. into... Yeah. Into contention here. Now, Grohachik Ram does still have the tiebreak win. Uh, so far, their, yes. Their Boris is better. But keep in mind, we've got two rounds left, so this could easily shift. Even mm-hmm. even Soft Hearts Equela, both still still quite in it, I'd say. So maybe I'm incorrect, but I think the way the Swiss works is you can't play the same person. So I don't think we can see a rematch, but I could be wrong. I don't think so. Yeah, did we see a rematch between Real NP and Grolagic Rom earlier? I don't. I don't think so. But interesting. So we can't see. I don't think we can see a, a showdown. It'll just come down to. It'll it'll really come down to those points and those tie breaks. Right. Okay, and the next round starting here. So when it shows right here, the t- the tie break is already set. I think it has to do with performance and stuff like that. Um, and so what Vishal really needs is Grohachigram not to win, Vishal to win. So let's take a look quickly at Grohachigram. Uh, we see this Grohachigram not playing the Liarda, playing the Polish instead. Uh, this position is very very nice for Black. Um, might see something like Queen H5, Knight H3. After the rook takes pawn takes, then you have a nice bishop d6 move. Looks like Grohachigram kind of blitzing out these moves. Clearly, clearly knows his line here. Not too worried about uh, White's replies. Definitely, yeah, and, and as you said, knight uh, bishop d6, very mm-hmm. strong. It looks like Grohachigram might have this one well in hand. Certainly not an easy position, but does have a lot more minor pieces. Um, the queen for anti-chess is trash. Um, is is it's not is not choice. incredibly maneuverable. And we might... I don't know, it's... And now we see giving away the bishop, and then you give away the knight, and this is completely one. So, if the tiebreak works the way we think it does... That will make Grohachigram our future challenger to Pinny7 in our next... Oh, yeah, quite true. Well, I think how the tiebreak works is that it adds the score of the opponent you beat. So Vishal, potentially, if he if he goes against two uh, higher place opponents and wins both of his games, could, could is, get in there. Is this round 11 or round 10? This is round 10, so there is oh. one more round. Oh, okay. I, I was mistaken. So, I thought it was round 11. Yeah, there's still some potential here. But mm-hmm. uh, Grohachik Ram, as we say, mopping it up. Mm-hmm. Well, a little bit of a blunder here. There was, there was like, mate and three, and he there there's no mate and three anymore. Um, oh, yeah, I see that move. King to c7 rather than c6. Interesting. So now he'll have to think about it a little bit. Still, uh, I mean, pretty, yeah. pretty dominating for Grohachigram here. So in this case, I'm actually gonna go back, take a look at, uh, take a look at Vishal's game for a second against Rekasa. And against Rekasa, so the fifth seed here um, could be. So if Vishal wins, it it would be a strong tiebreak addition to mm-hmm. his uh, to his score. Vishal with the black piece and is really thinking about his move. So maybe we see Queen takes e5, maybe? Take, take, take. Yeah, you're right. We do see that. Takes here. And then, after Bishop takes b1, uh, we'll see Queen takes a7. Bishop takes, and then the queen coming... Oh, actually, <laughs> maybe queen yeah. e5 was a blunder. Because now that I'm well, looking I at see, it... I mean, after after bishop takes b1 here, queen could take... Uh, right, a7. coming back. Right. Or, I mean, queen queen's better to just come back and take on uh, b1. Um, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, because after the queen comes back and takes on a1... Or b1, sorry, the, the rook has to go across and capture on f8. Oh, quite true. We see this instead. That's still quite defendable for white. Vishal, though, with 
One pawn only. Got to be careful about this rook and bishop lining up on, on b2 here. Mm -hmm. So moving out of the out way. way. I mean, what's the promotion here for Bishal? What is, he, what is he looking for? So, Bishop promotion definitely loses. you got to be careful about that. Um, uh, although, <laughs> if I look at it now, I'm looking at the Bishop promotion now, and it, honestly, m maybe I'm just not seeing it immediately. I, I definitely, Bishop promotion loses because of um, Rook h3, and then... Rook to b3 after bishop takes, and then king to d1. Oh, right. Yeah, that's correct. Because I was looking at that about giving the pieces away before the pawn, but uh, obviously that... Because then you'd have to push your pawn, but obviously there's a way. Uh, knight promotion, probably don't want to look at. Um, queen promotion, you're probably dead lost. Um, rook promotion, you're also definitely dead lost. So in this case, you're looking at king. For sure. Yeah, gotta be king only, pretty much. Yeah, rook loses to an interesting kind of wraparound of this of this c8. Rook has to come to down to a a5 for the final for the final push. But Vishal thinking it out, only down to 20 seconds. Mhm. Mm Gonna have to analyze his lines. He doesn't have the power of two people looking at the board. Yeah. Send so the, the key after the key after. King promotion is keeping one or both of your rooks, if possible, and bringing them over. Yeah. So maybe something like rook h8, and then you want to bring your rook to, uh, I don't know, somewhere like. You you want to get one of your rooks on the f file for sure. Or or advance the pawn extremely fast. Yeah, and it looks like that's what he's gonna go for. Always oh, gotta be careful of that pin. Moves it other way. So now, rook to, yeah, c4, rook promotion, and it's definitely winning for white. The question is, how difficult is it, and can it be pulled off by Ray Costa? But now, king versus king and rooks only is a draw, so he's got to be careful not to get rid of his, his mm -hmm. second rook, right? However, however, a lot of players don't properly play that endgame, and so it's very easy to uh, take advantage of... However, tricky move right here is you could just play king f, yeah, king onto the f file, and now after you move away the g rook, you move the the king onto the g file. Okay, but the oh, thing is, if you move the king onto the g file, then the rook can't move off of it. But, right, um, so the rook has to be given away. Exactly. Interesting. However, here now maybe you have some tactics, something like move that rook onto the d file like that. If if this king ever comes over, you move your other rook to the c-file, and you start marching your king forward. And this is the only ongoing game in this 10th round here, so... So yeah, king d4. Bichal playing really for his tournament life here. Yeah. Maybe a rook onto the, to an f-file, or or a b-file. You rather want to go f-file, and then king onto the e-file, back to rook on the c or b-file. Um... Or like that, you move, uh, you move your rook. Okay. Oh, away. and and this works out perfectly actually. That's actually a great move because now this king and rook versus king endgame is completely one for white because the black king's on the back rank. You can't you can't move it off. Uh, the one thing, yeah, white has to be careful of, and Ray Costa is certainly careful of, is that you don't play rook onto uh, the the sixth rank too early because for example rook d6 would have lost to, to king f7 uh, because the right. king and rook guard the, all, all the squares guarded. yeah so important here Turn just a waiting move like rook e5 for example that forces the king to go back to h8 and then and then you bring the rook over to um nice and he finds exactly that and then bring the rook back over to the f file Nice, Rook F5, and right, and then the king's gonna have to, he's in Zeus Wong. Mm -hmm. He'll have to move it away. So, very, very... very nice from Ray Costa. Yeah, very nice end game. Find. <laughs> Looks like Vishal contemplating his mistakes here. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting out the clock a little bit. Not a bad, not a bad plan, though. Get a little time before his 11th round, because... Get a little bit of a breather here. <laughs> 
but if we if we go back to the tournament now, uh, we need if Grohacha Grum to to become the official challenger, uh, just needs a draw here. No one else. The only actually the only way that anyone else could win would be if Sequela and Grohacha Grom get matched up and Grohacha Grom loses, but that's not gonna yeah not gonna happen. So it looks like uh, irrespective of what happens here, uh, Grohacha Grom is mm -hmm. gonna be. Our, Most likely, our yeah. Next challenger, mm -hmm. but let's yeah, let's take a look at the game. This is a, this is still quite a strong matchup though, Sarong versus Grohacha Grom. Mm -hmm. And opting for this a four move again. Uh, the one line that could be a little bit tricky out of this, um, maybe if if Sarang plays, uh, Bishop takes a four soon. Contemplating the only force move. <laughs> I, I always do find it amusing when people don't play a force. Yeah, after. me as well. Just wait there. See, when I'm playing these games, I I I'll take any time that I can get. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Just use it as a way to build up those five extra seconds because those could matter in an end game. Mm hmm, for sure. So now this double knight structure, most likely, for uh, for Grohachi Grom. Maybe bring your knights yeah, to. Yeah, like, yes. Yeah, B1, C1, good, good positions for the knight. Sets themselves up for, mm -hmm. for capture quite nicely. Now it looks like this classic Grohachi Grom kind of suffocation. He's going to start to move his pawns up. Mm -hmm. Probably king uh, off the c-file and then c4. Yeah. There it is. Oh. <laughs> Pause <it> exactly. <laughs> Ooh, strong knight move. Forcing mm -hmm. the king back. Right. And and Sarang playing... Both of them playing very quickly. Again, we get a game like this where we're on move 19 and both players almost have an extra minute. What it, that is one of the advantages of two plus five is if you're if you're still able to play fast you can you can manage to get up quite a bank of time for that the, those difficult end games. Mm -hmm. One thing Sarang's got to be careful of is moving the king onto the sixth rank because um, rook b one could those be knights, those knights ready to pounce. That eight pawn advance. Quite far into Black's territory. But now Grohacha Grom doing his classic suffocation. King and Rook are both sort of in a corner. The first, imagine, the first three here too. Yeah, probably. And and the whole fifth rank lower is now firmly in Grohacha Grom's hands. Yeah, true. Very, I mean. Very like classy showing of how to play anti chess is he takes space, he yeah. he stops his opponent's movement, he gets good minor piece position. You can see these knights that plays really saw so like solidly on a three c three and and he just makes small forward progressing moves and mm -hmm. wait what is Serang to do here? You can see he moves his book onto the h file, kind of a waiting move, not really having anything else to do. Yeah. And so I think what. Grohacha Grom is looking at soon is setting up a double capture with this uh, with this e pawn maybe knight d4 eventually to c6. Uh, meanwhile, setting up for the rook to come down for something like d1 to d8, and then you're moving your king back. And yeah, I mean, looks like that's exactly what we see. And I think it's, it's it might be game now. over now. Yeah, rook knight to d4, and that double capture is going to be too much after rook to d1. However, you do have to be careful because your e your e pawn's not going to be completely gone immediately. So you got to find a way to. Shouldn't be a problem though, as they did bank up an extra minute. So only now is he even below the original two minutes he started with. Right. Quite amusing. Roger Grom is still thinking about his next move. Maybe not quite ready to pounce with knight d4. Thinking about maybe some sort of pawn break? Yeah. Interesting, this h5 move does does provide a little bit of threat. Like, it provides a little bit of urgency to the... Yeah, true. So, Saran so finding game. some nice counterplay, mm -hmm. if, at the very least. So, in classic Grohacha Grom style, takes away all of his opponent's pieces. And now, like, 
The one thing that this does do is now this rook can't come to the h file, can't come to the g file, can't come to the f file. The rook can't move anywhere. And so, really, you're just moving the king back and forth. Not Super much you can do. Play. Yeah. Really, really, really interesting, really engaging. You don't, you don't see, like, it's, 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 some people think it's quite tough to play with so many pieces on the board in, in this kind of end game. People would rather, you know, sacrifice and kind of simplify, but Grohachik Ram showing that having more pieces is clearly uh, an asset to your position. Right. And here it is, is... Oh, and here's the huge and, chain. Very nice. Mm -hmm. And that's where all the, the chain pieces... So, this officially makes Grohachi Grom your, uh, your challenger of the board, champion. Uh, going yeah. on to play Pinny 7 next week. While we're waiting, we might as well uh, check in on, for example, Sequoia's game to see what could have happened. Sure, I just want to point out, I mean, Grohachi Grom obviously winning, but super strong performance, only dropping two games. The first six, uh, he won in a row against quite strong opponents. Right, yeah. I've made score of 46, so... Very impressive. Yeah, very, quite impressive performance. An 82% win rate in an arena like this is is more than impressive, for sure. And so in this Sequilla versus Mental Suicide game, in the last... In the last uh, Game we saw move 19, both players at 3 minutes. In this game we see move 18, both players below 25 seconds. Quite an interesting variance here. Mm -hmm. This goes to show you, though, I mean, opening prep can can get you a really long way. Grohacha Grom clearly knew what he was doing in that last game and was able to bank up that minute, whereas right. this game maybe there might not have been as much prep known and a lot more has to be put into the middle game thought. Mm -hmm. And that shows also if you're... If your 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 opponent is much higher rated, uh, you probably don't want to play super solid strong lines because someone like Grohacha Grom is just going to be up a minute on you and then is going to completely suffocate you the entire time. Very true. The ops for the night promo here, quite interesting. Yeah, I was going to say F three looks quite difficult to manage. Should be a. Should be a quick G4 from Mental Suicide here, I think, and there's not much uh, that can be done. There we see it. Oh, but uh, almost a almost a cool tactic. But uh, it would be nice if there was no H pawn, and your knight could attack the E4 pawn. A lot of ifs, but if it could, then you could capture that pawn while so true. the G pawn. Uh, and we see that sort of, but sadly your H pawn's right there. So, uh, but in any case, we've got two more ongoing games. Might as well take a look in here. Let's look at uh, Soft Heart versus Real NP. Our five quite, versus quite nine. Quite interesting. Game. Quite interesting. Two kings on the board from both sides. Yeah. So clearly some promotions happened earlier. Soft Heart can move with the white pieces, much more space. He's still got three pawns on the board, second, third, and fourth rank. Everything is quite connected, but it's going to be tough for him to to play against these two kings as they have the entire king side of the board kind of locked up. Right. Soft Heart opting to get a, get rid of the bishop. Ooh, interesting move. Mm -hmm. So now, I mean, he's got to move the king away, right? Uh, yeah, but you, you've also, like, you can't, yeah, you don't want to sacrifice it immediately, but you also got to be careful, like, uh, too quickly pawn pushing could lead to, uh, to certain blunders, for sure, like, uh, the, the point that real NP wants to do is, he wants to move his king over to the queen side as soon as possible, uh, just doesn't allow any, like, any pawn pushes, your opponent can't make any progress, um, meanwhile, Softheart also wants to take this this sort of bottom left section of the board so like the H G F file from the sixth seventh and eighth rank it's really a game of who can control that as quickly as possible and but however even if soft heart can't do that uh, may as long as you protect your pieces you can still uh, uh, manage some counterplay. True, kind of cocooning here from soft heart. Mm -hmm. Trying to maybe gain some time back on the clock, not. <laughs> Doesn't want to blunder instantly because this could be a difficult end game. Could could be a winnable end game even for White. Mm -hmm. Offers a draw actually. Mm -hmm. I look at I look at that as well because 
king f7, I think, immediately actually draws after you see something like king e6, knight e5, and then the problem is your king's your king on c3 is now so far separated that eventually you're just going to take that e pawn and then the f pawn, then the g pawn, then your kings are so far separated. So king f7 probably just draws immediately. We'll see if what real MP wants to do. Maybe wants to play it out. Thinks there there's some advantage here. He's not accepting the draw immediately, so he's clearly thinking about if he's got some sort of winning continuation. So he declines. Plays on, okay. yeah. Should be interesting. Like it's it's certainly not an easy win for White, and that's probably what Real MP is looking at. Is this is like this isn't an easy win. Yeah, and usually in in this kind of situation, I would love to be playing as the single king because you've yeah. got you've got only a few moves to consider really, and it's quite easy for your opponent to miss. Uh, right. Miss some lines with all their pieces on the board, so. Right, almost. Real MP, yeah, playing on. Almost impossible to play for White for sure. And soft art now really have to debate it. Now, as soon as you bring your king all the way down here, now it becomes tough because you got to start making different moves than just king c2, king d2, king c2, d king d2. Real MP, though, got to be careful. I don't think you can move on to the c file at all because of king king d6 wins instantly, I, I believe. King d6. All the pawns are going to be able to get rid of themselves along with the knight. Right, right. King d6, pawn e5, knight f. Five and then your pawns and king mop up. So real MP gonna have to stay on the B file. A little bit suffocated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a quayla in the spectator room. Says tense. I quite agree. These are some of the more interesting anti-chess end games, though. I think mm -hmm. you, got, you really gotta calculate your lines. Make sure you're not. Blundering instantly, but always making, always checking for those sneaky little tactics. Right, and again, it's such a confusing position. Like, there's so many, and this this could be a really nice move. Now you have to move the king back. Now this king's starting to be forced in the corner. Sorry, as I was saying, is these are really difficult positions because white. There's so many moves. Like every single move, you gotta think three or four moves ahead for both sides. So it's it's really difficult to analyze, especially like black's got nine different moves and they're probably all okay and white's probably got 12 different moves but y y you just don't know and now soft or uh, real np being forced into the corner with that king this and this king on the e5 square is no longer really uh, and competing I for squares yeah so i think this is winning for that. real np now because you've got king to e3 no matter what um F3, well, yeah, king to e3, to yeah, now just king to e3, because king defends e4, king defends f4, and pawn defends f4. So king yeah. e3 just, just completely, yeah, nice. completely yeah, wrecking, good well. find, yeah. So good for real MP to play on, ends up, ends up getting the win out of it. Up getting the win, yeah, yep, good, good find, good, good thinking with the singular piece, and going back to the tournament, Grohajic Ram with a performance of 2264, playing above his rating. Mm -hmm. Very nice. And we definitely want to give some shout out to our other competitors. We had a four-way tie for second um, between Ray Costa, Sequela, uh, Vishal, and Clunk. Um, oh, wow, yeah. Massive, massive tie for second. And even after that, like you, you have nine points, then you have seven, 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 six and a half, six and a half, six, five and a half, five and a half. Like you have so many people who are right there prepared for the win. Uh, but in the end, it will be Grohacha Grum next week taking on Penny Seven in the uh, in the Champion of the Board series. Um, anyways, thank you oh, yeah, everyone for yeah. Anyways, uh, thank you for thank you for tuning in uh, alongside uh, me alongside DDX Aiden. It was very very fun to commentate some amazing games. Yeah, um, definitely great games to watch. Great games to commentate. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, of course. Uh, it was a great time. Some amazing games. Uh, and we hope to see you back. Maybe maybe you'll watch these streams in the future. Maybe you'll uh, continue to follow the IAF and the IAF tournaments. Um, and, and maybe you'll even perform in some of these uh, tournaments soon yourself. Uh, not just yourself, but um, <laughs> but you as well. Um, uh, in any case, thank you all for watching. And uh, we will see you in the next episode. We'll see ya.